Hello friends, we are in the 12th week of our course on literature and life and we have uh, uh, Professor David Jayabalan from Layala College, English department. He has more than three decades of uh, experience in teaching language and literature. He has his PhD on English language teaching and his expertise is in that area but he has been teaching various courses at uh, Layla College for the students of BA and MA English and I am sure his expertise in uh, teaching of poetry will be very useful to our students. So, we have him here. Welcome sir. Thank you sir. Thank you for your invitation. Let us have his experience with us now. We will begin with uh, the basic question of uh, his understanding of poetry. What do you think is poetry for you sir? Yeah, poetry, if you ask me, it is a genre uh, which gives a scope for people to be imaginative, creative and uh, critical. Uh, a genre which uh, has all these uh, skills at one go and uh, where you read and enjoy, where you are able to read and interpret. And if you ask me what poetry uh, is exactly, poetry I would say is a feeling. Poetry is a feeling. Why do I say that it is a feeling? Uh, because you have something called a poem, but not in every poem you have got something that you can call poetic. Okay. Only one or two lines in every poem you would have what you call poetic. That is what I call poetry. In a poem you are able to point out there is poetry here, there is poetry there. So, there is a, a subtle distinction because a poem is a structural layout of a text, is it clear? Where words are put in order, where uh, figures of speech and literary devices are used, but uh, poetry is something where in uh, some part of the poem or the other, where you feel connected, which appeals to your senses, which appeals to your emotions, where you are able to feel one with the, that part of the text. That is where I would say there is poetry. So, I would like to make a distinction between a poem and a poetry. So, for me that is why I said poetry is a feeling. So, That's where great. you feel and uh, get connected to a poem that you come across while reading. That is great. Thank you sir. You have been teaching poetry for quite a long time. Is there any specific reason why do you like uh, poetry or poetry teaching? Basically, if you ask me, I am inclined to visualize things. Okay. Whatever I read, whatever I hear somebody narrating, immediately I travel to that place, I visualize that scene. Therefore, I find there is more scope for visualization uh, in poetry rather than prose. Prose, you know, that is prosaic, it tells you everything. There is not much scope for being imaginative, whereas here that suits my temperament where I have uh, a lot of uh, uh, scope for imagining things and visualizing what I read and all that. Therefore, if you ask me, basically I am inclined to that uh, uh, sense of reading poetry with a lot of imagination. Therefore, that suits my temperament. And in addition to that, the, I also have a tendency to appreciate the literary devices, the nuances of language, okay, the subtleties of the diction used in the, uh, in the poems. So, all these things definitely make me move beyond the text and uh, give a lot of scope for me to imagine, enjoy and appreciate poetry. Therefore, if you ask me that I like to teach poetry uh, because it suits my likes and the temperament as well. That is great. Compared you, to other genres. Uh, that is great. Uh, you have found a kind of match between your temperament and poetic temperament. Yeah, sure, sure. That is fine. What are the ways in which you approach poetry in the classroom? Generally, that is there is a traditional way of teaching poetry where you take a poem, a prescribed poem, where you read and then uh, make students listen to you and then you also, you read it in a way with a bit of intonation and uh, all those things which is really appealing to those students and which is also part of uh, developing reading skill, inculcating the reading skill among learners. So, therefore, here you read once and then you ask also the students to read and where you find that uh, um, the scope for uh, helping them improve their reading skill. 
and uh, after that I draw their attention to the nuances as you said the literary merits of the text and make them appreciate the use of uh, symbols, metaphors, images and uh, other figures of speech that uh, the poet is using to highlight his point of view. Okay, that is how I uh, love to teach uh, poetry. In addition to that, uh, if that comes under the traditional way of teaching, there is also uh, given the ICT in uh, ELT and all that, uh, there is lot of scope for teaching poetry in a very interesting manner, which I would call visual reading of poetry, where these days you have got uh, um, visuals by way of uh, pictures and uh, by way of uh, digitalization of uh, thing and uh, videographing of uh, the scene that is described in poetry. So, naturally there is something called visual reading, where instead of you reading and making them imagine, you also play out that poem. It can be an audio version or a video version, where you make learners to pick the accent and pronunciation, the style of reading with the intonation, making them listen to some good readers of poems. Sometimes you have even poets reading out poems. Uh, there is a good opportunity for uh, uh, students to listen to the uh, poet of uh, the prescribed poem reading out it. And uh, in that sense, uh, audio helps you to pick up those sub skills of uh, uh, reading. And in addition to that, this visual presentation makes uh, uh, reading and enjoying of poems to a great extent. And uh, it also becomes useful because you know these days, uh, everything is uh, given on a platter to learners. Even the creative and the imaginative skills of the learners are killed. Okay, okay there is no scope for imagining. Where there is scope for imagining, you you also have a pictorial version of it. the moment you bring. No, everything is there on a mobile. Everything is there on a platform where there is absolutely there is no scope for imagination. So when that is the case, I think we should actually kindle that uh, sense of imagination and creativity by making them watch and transcend those videos and then take to the next level. So, that is more uh, useful and uh, enjoyable for students, visual reading, which uh, I would call visual reading of poems. So, from your um, uh, response, I understand that students must be able to visualize poetry, improve their imagination. Yes, certainly, certainly. That is the best part of poetry. That is why when I teach uh, poems to students, uh, particularly the romantic poems and all that where there is much description of nature, I tell them unless you visualize definitely it is not going to be interesting to you, unless you take your say you move to that uh, location or uh, the spot or the place which the poet is talking about or put yourself in that position and uh, uh, read. I do not think there is uh, much scope for enjoying a poem, I think that is what I insist on. At least the uh, students who have uh, that uh, skill they can be taught to they, they can be taught to use their skill of imagination and uh, creativity by associating themselves with the text that uh, they read and then moving beyond the text so i think that is how we should involve students if we really want to make them enjoy poetry you should first of all tell them that you should be prepared to visualize and imagine things that they are uh, describing or portraying in a given poem that is why I insist on that. Now, let us come to this question of how you teach poetry in the class. Normally, I read out a poem and then uh, explain uh, certain lines and uh, not that you should uh, uh, explain line by line. You should actually take the teaching of poetry to the next level of enabling the learners interpret the text for themselves. Is that clear? Yes. They should by themselves be able to interpret the text. That uh, interpretative skill I think uh, you should cultivate in learners. Therefore, I am not in agreement with the people saying that every line has to be explained because learners themselves are capable of it. All that you have to do is we should teach them to appreciate poetry by explaining a few lines and drawing their attention to the literary quality uh, what we would call generally the literary merits or literary devices or figures of speech used in the rhyme scheme and all that the pattern of poetry what what uh, genre the poem falls under whether it is an ode or dramatic monologue or a sonnet or whatever it is. So, you just tell them and ask them to identify if you give a definition of a sonnet where you have octave and sestet. 
and then you tell them okay this is a poem can you identify we do not need to do that what they know that the 8 plus 6 lines or whatever that uh, pattern may be which sonnet, uh, sonnet that you are talking about whether Petrarchan or Shakespearean or whatever it is they would be able to if they know uh, the definition and the features of uh, that particular format they would be able to so you have to all that you have to do is uh, to be a facilitator here you facilitate not for uh, just for language acquisition you are also facilitating them to enjoy and appreciate poetry so uh, i would uh, prefer to do that where beyond my explanation i would also be interested in elucidating them with the examples highlighting the beauty of the poem why it is uh, so wonderful a poem as it is by drawing their attention to those um, uh, the special features of poetry. So, the crux of your uh, response is that the students involvement is much more important than anything else. Definitely, if there is scope for making learning of poetry or enjoying of poetry, I do not want to say learning of poetry, there is a way of enjoying poetry yes. by making it interactive. You can mm -hmm. always, uh, the thing is that uh, we should uh, really value uh, the skills of the learners and involve them. If you just give them the scope, you know, they would just grab it. Therefore, uh, you even if you explain the first stanza of a poem and then once they get the context of it and then you ask them, okay, come on, tell me, read the next uh, stanza and tell me what is it. So, they would be able to connect because they got the context of it and what is happening. So, in that sense, I think you can also make it interactive, learning of uh, or the um, enjoyment of poetry, uh, an interactive activity in the class. So, that is how I would uh, like to look at it. So, your approach to poetry is rather interactive. Yeah, sure, sure. Otherwise, there is no point because you enjoy poetry, but uh, just like uh, writers when they share with others through their writing what they enjoyed. As a teacher also, you when you enjoy a poem, you should also make uh, others enjoy it. True. Not true. Uh, sometimes it is very unfortunate that uh, we uh, end up enjoying teaching by it. We are very happy about uh, how we have taught this particular poem and all that. Uh, but then what is the result? What is the outcome? What is the response of the learners? Were they with you while you were uh, discussing the yeah, poem? Yeah. If a few students say, sir, we enjoyed the poem, I think that itself is a, a great outcome of uh, teaching poetry, I would say. I think that is how you should look at it. Good. Now, uh, since you have been focusing on the idea of visual poetry, uh, can you connect this with uh, the kind of strategies that you use in the classroom for teaching uh, different kinds of poems? Yeah, definitely. See, as I said, you can use uh, uh, several strategies while uh, teaching a poem. You can teach a poem, you can render the poem across uh, different uh, genres. Sometimes you can paraphrase it, sometimes you can summarize it. Sometimes you can also convert it into a short story. If it is a dramatic monologue, you can actually make them enact it, okay? Yeah. They can actually act it out. Or if there are students who are interested in music, they can compose music to it. If there are artists, they can convert uh, uh, the poem into uh, a pictorial form. Is that yes. clear? Just like we yes. have got graphic literature. I think Howard Gardner would put it in his multiple intelligence. Every student in the uh, class has a different intelligence, a special intelligence, where I think uh, there is scope only in poetry, uh, where uh, students of different uh, um, intelligences can participate and make the learning of uh, it best. For example, uh, those who are given to uh, interaction, um, they can uh, write even a script, they can even uh, write a script with a bit of dialogue and uh, they can act it out or something like that, definitely there is plenty. The best part is I would say, is I think dramatic monologue of uh, uh, Robert Browning, My Last Duchess. Why I am referring to is, it is a very well known uh, poem and where learners also would be able to connect it. There is a wonderful video of it available in YouTube and uh, learners also can act it out, where you can display uh, the individual talent of uh, writing um, uh, speaking it out as a monologue, one student can perform it or you can even two uh, take uh, two other students or uh, three, there is an emissary also. Yeah. So, you can take uh, two other students and actually perform it in the class. That's I think possible. that is how, uh, so that is uh, where they can write uh, dialogues for that. Yes. He has written it in poetry form, you can convert it into a, so there is plenty of scope for poetry I would say. Mm. So, um, that is how uh, 
I would uh, prefer to use uh, different strategies when it comes to teaching poetry, not just uh, one man teaching, just uh, a teacher explaining everything, ending up with asking questions. Poetry is all about creativity. I think, uh, as you say, teaching a poetry also must have that uh, creative element to make it more enjoyable for everybody. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Because if you have as many students in the class, I mean, not correct. And uh, where uh, just now as I said, there are as many students with uh, as many different intelligences. Yes. So, you give food for uh, thought, you are giving scope for everybody to uh, exploit the poem uh, according to his interest, his likes and uh, his caliber, his intelligence. So, I think you will, uh, of course, it may be time consuming if you are worried about completing the syllabus that is uh, going to be a bit taxing. But uh, not necessarily with one poem you should apply all these strategies. So, definitely you will have half a dozen poems when it comes to a syllabus. So, uh, to different poems you can uh, use you different, can apply strategies. different strategies and uh, thereby bringing variety in the class also that is also possible. Yes, you have been teaching poetry for a long time. Are there some poems which you frequently refer to in your discussion of poetry? Yeah, definitely. Say when it comes to uh, teaching of romantic poetry, where with the publication of lyrical ballads in 1798, Wordsworth stated the romantic theory. So, romantic poems cannot be understood without understanding the romantic uh, theory behind it. So, you do not need to talk to them about uh, romantic theory per se from uh, his lyrical ballads and all that, but uh, what is important is that even from a little bit of poem that is prescribed for the, for example, daffodils. If you take uh, daffodils, I would say daffodils uh, is a quintessence of romantic theory. Mm. So, what is romantic theory? How do they define poetry? How do the romantics Coleridge. Wordsworth and Coleridge uh, define poetry is they would call poetry spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, emotions recollected in tranquility. This is the crux of uh, romantic theory and this uh, small poem daffodils has it got in all its essence spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. What happens in the beginning of the poem those who read the poem daffodils they would know that uh, the poet happens to come across uh, during his usual walk on a countryside he comes across a host of daffodils he says 10,000 saw I at a glance can just imagine 10,000 I at a glance means the stretch of just such a vast stretch where you have this yellow golden daffodils tossing their heads in brightly dance as he puts it. When he comes across this the immediate reaction spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling there is a spontaneous reaction he is so carried away by the beauty of uh, uh, this scene. So, you will find the spontaneity is there spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. So, the, this is a sense he experiences. So, the sight of it definitely creates a kind of spontaneous reaction from uh, the part of the poet where he is very happy at the sight of a, a host of daffodils. But then what happens the latter part of the theory says emotions recollected in tranquility. Actually, he does not write the poem there itself. He comes home, that also is described in the poem that towards the uh, fag end of the poem. Often, when on my couch I lay, evening, that is uh, later on in the evening when he uh, lies down in his couch, they flash upon my inward eye. In other words, the emotion that he experienced spontaneously at the sight of a host of daffodils, 10,000 saw, uh, saw I at a glance that uh, scene comes back to him flashing back in his mind emotions recollected in tranquility he is recollecting that emotion that he experienced at the sight of a host of daffodils and tranquility why tranquility that is in uh, in silence tranquility means in peaceful situations in silence in peace so evening in the quiet evening when he is there lying down on his couch that scene flashes on his uh, in his mind and that is where poetry is born so, so it is not uh, as people say just like that they take a piece of paper and write poetry it does not no, happen no, no. so it is actually emotions recollected in tranquility experience occurs somewhere but then at the moment of inspiration when you are recalling that scene it serves as a great resource for your poetry. So, when you are talking actually about this romantic theory 
this uh, short poem daffodils it can be taught at various levels uh, for uh, uh, students at the high school level it is just a simple poem where you describe the beauty of it. Daffodils taught at different levels even at the MA level when you are talking a serious thing uh, to even to students of literature when you are talking uh, seriously in terms of uh, teaching um, that is theories of poetry and what Wordsworth says I think that is more applicable. So, uh, you have got uh, I can give several examples where you have got uh, every poet uh, is interested in writing um, theory of poetry just yes. like Frost has done it in his uh, uh, the figure of poem makes. Edgar Allan Poe he has written an essay the American poet philosophy of composition yes. Okay, yes. where he takes up the poem in his own composition mm -hmm. Raven for example where he elucidates the whole essays uh, about how he uh, what he believes. Uh, uh, writing poetry uh, is all about. So, like that when you are uh, talking about a particular poet and uh, what has been his belief uh, his way of writing poetry, naturally you have to discuss what he has said about the poetry also. So, if you are teaching romantic poetry I think this is a perfect piece where you can actually uh, make use of. So, you uh, seem to be teaching more of romantic poetry. Not exactly, I can teach any kind of poetry <laughs> because uh, in the beginning I said you know I love poetry, okay. I love teaching poetry, anything that is uh, I enjoy teaching poetry with a bit of preparation, with a bit of reading about it, the background and all that, the context and all that. So, I enjoy reading uh, T.S. Eliot, okay. you know, correct. There is some passion about uh, Yeah, that is what I am coming to. Yeah, that is why I, I started the whole thing saying that is if you really love as a teacher of literature you are teaching everything, but even there there is uh, uh, something which you are inclined to enjoy. So, like that uh, some teachers are passionate about dramas, some people are passionate about uh, fiction. So, like that uh, you can also be passionate about uh, teaching poetry. So, okay. that is what. Okay. Uh, you are teaching poetry very passionately to your students. How do the students respond to you in the class? Now, you yourself will understand how I am passionate about poetry yeah. and uh, students would definitely be mesmerized I would say in my class and uh, they would be so uh, uh, absorbed in what is being discussed because I take them as you said to the next level. Is that clear? Yes. It is not just uh, giving the meaning of words, explaining the line and all that. And when you are able to connect ideas, relate issues and then by way of allusions, anecdotes and lot of things, lo a number of other things, naturally uh, they are able to connect with what is happening and definitely I am sure that uh, even from the kind of feedback I get from them. Can you give some samples of feedback that is what we want? Yeah, some that ideas. Is, yeah, that is what I am talking about. Eh? Mm. When it comes to the response of the students, mm. how do you know they are telling the truth? Yeah. So, if you really okay, then you, you are saying that you are enjoying it. Can you tell me uh, the meaning of uh, the seventh line and eighth line? Mm. What is so significant about those lines? Definitely not only uh, they would be able to repeat the interpretation that I had given, they would also be able to connect uh, what uh, uh, they have understood from the poem. I would ask someone else to tell me uh, the significant use of the symbol. Okay, here is a symbol use. What do you understand? Symbols can be interpreted in uh, uh, so many ways. So, just like the color red has got, if I am able to see two meanings for the color red, the student will be able to add two more to it. Yes. So, therefore, the interpretation does not end with uh, the teacher doing it. You can also check their ability to interpret and, and whether they are they really enjoyed by uh, throwing them a few questions as to um, interpret uh, the figure of speech or literary device used and all that I think uh, that itself is a clear indication that they have been uh, enjoying it. So, that is how I would put it. Uh, yeah, that means generally the students response to poetry is very positive. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, the, the, the question is uh, generally it is uh, positive. But uh, these days we have a classroom of 80 students, 90 students where you cannot expect all the 80 and 90 to be so passionate and so interested. Mm. Just like as you said they will have their own uh, preferences and all that. It is a matter of taking everyone along with you in the class, is that clear? So, you cannot just let them go. 
if somebody is not inclined to enjoying poetry actually the success of your teaching lies in making him also see the beauty of yeah, poetry yeah. in making him also see and appreciate the reading poetry true so i think uh, if that happens we are, we are not promising anything those students who are inclined to enjoy poetry we don't need to worry but the success is when you are able to impress upon the others to see the beauty of a poem at the end of the day where they also say very good sir very nice i think that uh, itself is a very good feedback for you that's so wonderful discuss, yeah. that's wonderful you have now uh, many years of teaching poetry have you gained something from poetry for your own life and i say if you ask me what have i gained uh, um, from poetry simple answer is the pleasure of reading it just the pleasure the joy of reading it okay and in addition to that it also provokes you to think okay you become uh, more creative more critical more interpretative and those uh, higher skills are fine tuned excellent not exactly that they are fine tuned they go to the next level for example to put it in a very simple term when you teach a poem in a, a probably a poem for the first time uh, probably you may be able to talk about it uh, for 10 minutes let's say mm. but then uh, the meanings get accrued in course of time that uh, next year you are teaching that poem for 20 minutes mm, yeah because your experience one uh, what you have come across you are uh, able to see newer and newer meanings mm. just like a uh, classics i mean not correct shakespeare why we are able to enjoy shakespeare even now today is because they are applicable to even uh, current issues mm. current problems mm. so we are able to relate our problems with the, the problems of shakespeare's characters similarly a poem written long back for a particular context and all that they do have what has been my experience last year is not the same no we go through several. so when you read just like you read a bible you read bible or gita or whatever it is you don't read when every time you read you make new meanings out of it mm. similar i would say for poetry also mm. even a poem when you read uh, second time third time after a break when you read again you are able to see newer and newer meanings that is what i would say uh, your uh, horizon of knowledge wisdom and uh, the skills of uh, uh, critically interpreting a text they get to widen so mm. that uh, quality definitely you master when you teach a uh, teach poetry uh, for quite some time that means you have gained the uh, interpretative skills over the years yeah sure 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 definitely we can teach poetry for pleasure but our students have to pass examination how do you help your students to write answers to questions in the examination on or about poetry See, generally, when we said questions, we have uh, all the learners in mind. Yes, is that clear? Just now, as you said, in a class of eighty, not everyone will be passionate about poetry. Not everyone will be. There will be people to pass the exam. Is yeah. that clear? Yeah. So, therefore, when you said question, for example, when you teach a poem, when you said questions, you must also take into consideration the average students, the average students uh, who are there to pass the paper. Is that clear? so although ideally i may want to uh, ask challenging questions where i want to uh, find out their uh, interpretative skill or uh, creative ability okay or critical thinking skill all these things are higher skills which i am interested in finding but i i also know that uh, not everybody is capable so i would vary the difficulty level of the questions for to meet the needs of the average learners i would ask uh, moderate questions where anybody with a bit of reading and understanding would be able to uh, respond to the question and pass but those who really want to excel those those uh, students of uh, the higher order if they really want to excel and master and they want to score i would definitely ask for extension questions okay where i would uh, in fact i i can even give a companion poem to a prescribed poem yeah. and then ask them to interpret apply a theory so that is next that is analyzing an unseen poem critically analyzing an unseen poem of course companion poem it can be a poem a companion poem for the prescribed poem or a poem written by the same poet a poem of a particular theme so i can always give so when i have this option those who were there just to pass 
they would opt for the first type and those who really want to take up the challenge they will go for the next one. But ideally I would say extension type of question only uh, is uh, um, more uh, challenging where you actually uh, take them beyond the text. That means you discuss these uh, different kinds of questions in the class, am I right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, not in the form of question and answer and all that. Even uh, our way of treatment of the poem would mm. say, am I not correct? So, there are different levels of uh, just like uh, you have literal and uh, figurative uh, level of uh, uh, meaning. You also have uh, the ordinary way of uh, telling just like when students watch a drama in English, uh, these days there is a habit of giving the summary of it in the beginning itself. Yeah. So, that uh, even those who are not so familiar with the uh, text or the story, they would be able to follow. So, a minimal guarantee is given like that. Similarly, when it comes to examination also, there is a kind of uh, balance I would say that is maintained in setting of the question paper. Okay. If you look at it from the examination point of view. Yeah. Now, we come to the last question. What have you learnt from the poems for living your life meaningfully? I think uh, it is more or less uh, the answer that I had given earlier that is I enjoy teaching poetry that is one thing, but uh, I would say that uh, reading of poetry, enjoying of poetry makes uh, our life meaningful. Uh, I would say poetry makes our life more poetic, beautiful and meaningful. I think at the end of the day we should make our life a poetic, beautiful and meaningful as poetry is. So, that is how I would uh, uh, look at if you are asking me what I have learned from poetry. Definitely and uh, in fact, I can go to uh, the different levels just like a poem has got its own structure, a form, yeah. the, you also organize your life. <laughs> that is excellent. Poetry yeah. helps you to organize your yeah. life very well. You organize your thoughts, you organize your lifestyle, there is no deviation, everything has to be in its right, just like a word has, has more meaning when it is used in the right place. Things that you do, the things that you speak, when they are done and uttered in the right place, in the right context, I think uh, that is an art which I would say that poetry helps you, reading of poetry and teaching of poetry helps you to cultivate. That is a great I answer, I am happy about it. Yeah. Uh, since uh, you have so much interest in poetry, do you like to read some poems for us? Yeah, sure, if you permit me, I, please, will, please. Uh, I will read. Yeah, yeah please read some. And, uh, for some <coughs> full poem or uh, some extracts you may. I have just uh, chosen a very short poem by uh, Robert Frost. The poem is called Design. Shall I read out? Yeah, please. Yeah. This is for your uh, reading yeah. aloud. Design by Robert Frost. I found a dimpled spider fat and white on a white heel all holding up a moth like a white piece of rigid satin cloth. Assorted characters of death and blight mixed ready to begin the morning rite like the ingredients of a witch's broth. A snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth and dead wings carried like a paper kite. What had that flower to do with being white, the wayside blue and the innocent heel all? What brought the kindred spider to that height, then steered the white moth thither in the night? What but design of darkness to appall, if design govern a thing so small. Do you like to share your thoughts on this poem? Yeah, actually I thought of doing it in the beginning itself, oh, I so see. that the reading of uh, the uh, poem is enjoyed. The poet happens to see, he comes across in the field a sight, what is that sight? A dimple spider, spider you know, that spider is uh, there upon uh, white heel all flower, it is building its uh, web and uh, in that you can imagine the flower white heel all 
and upon that the spider has gone and settled down and it is building its web to catch its um, um, bait. And what happens? In that direction a moth comes and a moth comes and gets caught in the web of the spider. Now, what is happening is the moth becomes the food for uh, the spider which uh, the poet uh, would prefer to call it beginning the morning rite like the ingredients of a witch's broth. And this is the scene, this is the scene that he talks about, but uh, this simple scene takes uh, the poet to the philosophical level. So, what is he contemplating upon this site? The questions that he asks is that uh, the dimple spider okay, white in color and you have the keel all flower. What drove the spider to choose that flower and come and settle down on top of it? That is point one. Next thing is the moth. Flower is like this one single stand of flower and you have uh, the heel of flower and in it you find the spider with its web. There is plenty of place for the moth to fly and uh, fly around. He is asking the question, what brought the moth exactly in that direction? Of the spider's to the, yeah, what brought the moth to the spider's web? How is it possible? That is what he says, unless there is a design behind it, there is a plan behind it. Our life, human life, is uh, basically people believe based on a design, mm. and who is a designer? A designer is God, He has a plan for us. Those who believe in destiny, they believe strongly in it. Whatever happens to us. We cannot do anything about it because it is all predetermined, it is all determined by God, it is all written in my faith. That is how we tend to think. So, in that context, if you apply that same uh, uh, idea here, similar things seem to be happening. That is why he is asking what brought the moth in that direction and become a, a food for the spider. And uh, the final thing that he concludes that is. How can you call this design uh, nothing but a design of darkness? Mm. It is a design of darkness, evil design because it causes the death of uh, the moth okay? yeah, yeah. and which you never ex uh, expected that uh, it would happen like that. And the final question he ends up is, if design govern in a thing so small, he says, if the creator has got uh, such a design for such a small thing like a spider and moth, mm. what design can govern human life? True, very true. So, with that note he finished, though I, it is a way I, I enjoy this poem that mm. is just for its philosophical content. Mm. How much how a simple incident uh, uh, site drives a poet to take it to the next level of um, a philosophical level of talking about human destiny, quite scary. Yeah, it is quite scary when you think of the, he is asking straight away this question. If God has uh, got a design for <laughs> such a small being like this, mm. think of the design that he has got for us. We do not know. <laughs> yeah, we do not know. We do not know. <laughs> so, that is what he is talking about. Mm. So, that is why I enjoy that. Just now, we have been telling you know, enjoy reading poetry, mm. okay, mm. and uh, you have meaning for your life. At the same time, also you have you derive pleasure out of. So, based on uh, Frost's poem, do you think that there is a design uh, in bringing us together for this course? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I would say there is a design. I mean, not correct? Did we plan it out? No. Was there a plan when you started this course that you would have an interaction like this? It never have. Yeah, the, um, I don't know whether you had it or not. But even the idea of having a panel discussion, if you are a strong believer, I am not a believer basically of in destiny and fate and all that, eh? but uh, a strong believer in fate would uh, uh, call any coincidence, he would not call any incident a coincidence, he would call it a planned one, planned uh, uh, incident. So, that is why uh, even I would call it is a decide, why should you have it today? Yeah. Why not uh, yesterday or day after tomorrow? Why today? Why this afternoon? And uh, you know, if you seriously look at it, I am not propagating the idea of destiny and all that. Eh? There is something working uh, beyond us, making things happen for us, making things happen. 
and uh, which can be good as well as uh, bad we are let us not uh, uh, stretch it far mm -hmm. okay that will be that will lead us to superstition and all that mm -hmm. but uh, if you look at small things happening around you can't i can give plenty of examples to show where uh, there is a hand of god okay not necessarily we should remember maradona in the famous <laughs> world cup hand of god and all mm -hmm. that uh, there is a hand of god in whatever that we if you are really a, a spiritual man a believer in uh, uh, god's way of working you would definitely feel he has got a plan for you okay. all right how would a non believer uh, look at this poem which one this uh, design uh, you your approach to the poem looks like more of a believer. personal subjective yeah, yeah no 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 i don't think that uh, there is anything uh, subjective my interpretations are uh, uh supported by secondary sources okay okay it's an interpretation where several people have uh, also endorsed okay and uh, uh, just now as i've been telling uh, it somehow uh, tends to coincide with uh, our because we have to interpret a poem in the true sense of what the poet would have said i don't know non believer uh, it is nothing to do with uh, religion philosophy and all that uh, probably a person who does not this this itself can uh, this simple poem can uh, even i said you know strategies they can it can, it can take you to the next level of having a debate in the class okay there will be students of uh, the, the, those who believe in destiny and those who don't believe okay you can have a wonderful uh, uh, debate which you can evolve out of this poem you can have a panel discussion talking <laughs> about this i mean not correct yes and uh, so you find uh, i don't know whether uh, non believer has got this is nothing to do with the believer non believer okay. this is only i would say uh, it is triggering a point of discussion okay it is triggering a point of, this is this is a thing which triggers uh, a discussion among believers and non believers okay okay and that itself is a great thing the, basically frost was uh, he comes from a, a puritanic tradition yes okay true, true. so a person come if you know Uh, the lifestyle of puritans and the, the puritanic age and all that uh, and being a puritan a very strong religious person i don't think that he could have written anything other than uh, any other meaning yeah, in this yeah, yeah. so uh, i can justify the interpretation taking to the personal life of uh, robert uh, poet also i mean not correct yes, if yes. he had been a non believer probably we don't know what but uh, he being a very uh, strong religious person spiritual person i am sure that uh, coming from such a uh, uh, puritanic background i don't think that he could have had anything else other than this okay. so uh, that's uh, that's quite a bit convincing okay uh, so i would uh, end up mm. so we have had a wonderful discussion on uh, teaching and uh, reading poetry thank you so much for coming to our studio and sharing your rich experience with our learners uh, thank you for the wonderful opportunity sir i i am sure that i been a bit uh, uh, motivating and uh, inspiring for students of your course who are doing this course as you said i am sure that the students of uh, students who are going through this course as you said not everyone should be passionate about but if our discussion has been helpful in uh, uh, making a few uh, students who are not so passionate about poetry Uh, if our discussion can uh, motivate and drive some people to pick up a book of book of poems and then start reading and uh, uh, start enjoying and appreciate i think uh, our discussion would serve the purpose that's what i that's how i would uh, conclude thank you thank you thank for you, the sir. opportunity thank you